This podcast contains spoilers, so listen at your own risk or call back after you watch the movie. You know who you call. Leave a message. Maybe they'll call you back. Then again, maybe they won't. We're having ourselves quite a little game of blue tag here. Ring, ring, ring. Uh, I usually get this guy's answering machine. I'll call you right back. If you're there, please pick up the phone. I really want to talk to you. I check my fucking messages every day when I go home from work. My answer machine, zero. I got a blinking light. All I have to do is pick up this phone right here, inform the cinema, and your plan's kaput. No, I ain't got no phone. I had to pull, you know, because people call all the time, and uh, who needs the aggravation, right? Interruptions. Just uh, running an errand from my door now, so not sure how much she's going to let me talk, but I watched the In the Company of Men the other night for the first time. Um, I remember when I first got into movies, like really, really got into movies and sort of became a bit of a film buff and was watching everything I could get my hands on. That was 1999. And Neil Labute had made his two, still to this day, his two most revered films directly before that second one came out in 98 so i kind of just missed those films coming out uh but they were very much still in the conversation i was trying to think of like who now would be like getting that kind of buzz maybe it would be like Jurgis lanthimos or someone just someone who's making like low budget character drama things with a very specific like recognizable style um, not that there's any stylistic similarity whatsoever between those two directors, but that kind of thing of like, he was getting a lot of buzz and people were, you know, very excited to work with him and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, never really went back and checked out those first two movies of his. Um, I, I think I actually did either watch all of or some of In the Company of Men at one point in my life but didn't i i think i didn't connect with it uh i'm not sure if i i I can't really remember the context but as i watched it now again there was a certain amount of familiarity to it um it's yeah it's an interesting movie i mean it'd be interesting to hear your take on it um it's very rare that you see a film where the the main characters your sort of entry point into the story, the people that you're following the whole way through it are just so unlikable. Um, and obviously deliberately so. And, and on a kind of a meta level, I've, I've coincidentally sort of learnt over the past week or so that, uh, what's his name, Aaron Eckhart is supposed to be fairly similar to his character um maybe not on the womanizing level but just in terms of like what a like sort of self-centered horrible person he is now uh i don't know if that's true but that's come from like hundred it's kind of these things one of these things like ellen degeneres where it's like once you get to like the hundredth report of someone who had nothing to gain and he's just like met him in passing and instantly thought he was like just a complete prick it starts to, um, you know, carry some water. Um, so that was a, 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 another layer of my watching it. I mean, he's fantastic in the movie, probably the best that I've seen him, and and I've always thought he was good. So, uh, yeah, kind of fits that he's playing some sort of version of himself. Uh, but yeah, uh, striking to see a movie with such unlikable people. Um, I watched it middle of the night and then the next day i watched uh, your friends and neighbors which is the second film that he made and i think neil the butte maybe like martin mcdonough is one of these people who half of his career is in cinema but maybe the more significant half of his career is in theater so if you look through his filmography it, it starts out on the high of in the company of men and then it uh, it just gets sort of increasingly worse from there, um, eventually hitting the Wicker Man remake, which I personally have time for, but it is sort of 
widely considered to be a terrible movie, almost like one of the most famously bad movies of the last 20 years. And I think his films since then have, haven't garnered much more critical praise. But maybe his plays um, have been a bit more consistent, although I did happen to see that the reviews were dwindling on those as well. Anyway, that's by the by. Uh, In the Company of Men is a great idea. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a kind of almost like a high concept movie, like Speed or something. It's just the, the entire movie is just, what if this happened? What what if, what if this? Um, hang on a sec. I'm just trying to hold an umbrella over my daughter as I'm moving. It's not really raining. It's just like ever so slightly drizzling, but she loves the umbrella. She's trying to make sure that she walks directly under it all the time. And it's, it's a whole ordeal. Um, but yeah, uh, Eckhart's amazing. Um, I I didn't clock that um, t- that final twist. I mean, I, I I got it when when we got to it, like you know, just directly before it. But I didn't sort of uh, I didn't think that that was an option. Um, that that the deaf girl isn't the only sort of pawn in the game. That the the other guy is as well. Um, thought the other guy was pretty good as well actually is it kind of interesting that Eckhart springboarded into this giant career where the other guy didn't um the deaf girl was brilliant as well actually and I was sure that she was deaf but looked her up afterwards and you no know, she's oh she just you know studied it very well and and did a very convincing job with it um yeah, good flick all round. Um, somewhat uncom- uncomfortable viewing. Uh, she wants to go up in a wall now. Hang on a sec. Sorry, I'm very distracted sending this voice message, but I'm not finding many other opportunities to send this out. So, um, yeah, I like the movie. Um, I like what it did with a limited budget. Like, it's often when you see something that's like, it's got no money to play with and it's got a director who is clearly a writer first and foremost you kind of be expecting absolutely no visual flair whatsoever and there isn't really any visual flair but it, it with those little interlude title card things where they have that sort of tribal drumming playing and then just the very simplistic camera work throughout hey hey did um it kind of I don't know, it just, it all kind of works as a package. It feels like a movie somehow, rather than just feeling like, I don't know, like fly on the wall type thing. It's, yeah, it's it's a fairly decent presentation. And yeah, uh, I was happy with it. It'd be interesting to see what you say. I mean, it's been a few days since I've seen it now. So kind of um, probably forgetting a lot of the little details and, also, because I've seen another film by the same director now, there's this kind of thing of like, you know, I mean, any any director, be it Tarantino or Kevin Smith or whoever, who like, comes out with this like exciting style, um, when they get to the next film, then they're kind of, uh, oh, hang on, one sec. Now she wants to hold the umbrella. Um, yeah. I'm probably gonna have to wrap this up because I'm trying to like wrangle a circus as I walk down this little path here with like cyclists going by and everything. So it's really every possible scenario of how we could be doing this walk. She's tried, she's rotated through. Um, yeah, I don't know. Lost my tra- train of thought, but oh yeah, yeah. Your friends and neighbors now is like part of my mind when I'm thinking about this film, and that's a film that's less consistent. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, it is a cat. Um, yeah, we'll say hello. Um, but it, it, as as dark and as yeah as dark as uh, your as in the company of men is, there are scenes, particularly one scene in your friends and neighbors that are way way darker and way heavier, um, and there are well, there's at least one character. Maybe arguably multiple characters in uh, 
your friends and neighbours that kind of give Aaron Eckhart's character in in the Company of Men a run for his money in terms of <laughs> what a complete asshole or just beyond asshole, just literally psychopath. Um, yeah, again, interesting to see a movie. I mean, I just, I, other than American Psycho, I can't think of many films. I think I can think of very few films where the lead character or lead characters are psychopaths and are completely morally reprehensible. Um, and so, yeah, that certainly makes it stand out from the crowd. Anyway, uh, I'm waffling on a bit now, but I did like the movie. Certainly encouraged me to check out more from Neil Debut. I had already seen Nurse Betty and the Wicker Man remake sort of as they came out. And now I've, I've I guess I've, I've at this point probably seen about a third of his movies. He's got a lot of movies that are like not very well regarded. I'm trying to stick to ones that he's written as well. So otherwise I feel like, well, what's the point? It's not like I'm really drawn to him as a director per se. Hey man, um, yeah, just caught the movie now. Uh, by the way, is your daughter uh, a cat lover? If so, I've got I've got loads of videos as a crazy cat lady myself that I could send her to entertain her. Any excuse? Um, yeah. So bear in mind, obviously, you did a great job of juggling <laughs> that voice note with an umbrella with a tour de france coming through and all sorts so i'm as you know dying with a tooth infection either that or a fucking brain tumor but i am a hypochondriac um so if i if i let a sudden cry out or anything like that spare in mind i got tooth pain <laughs> it's calmed down a bit now but let, let's see how it goes um very interesting movie very very interesting it's almost like if somebody watched a rom-com like Hitman or something about Mary and they decided, wow, if this wasn't either a charming romantic comedy starring Glenn Powell or something absolutely ridiculous starring Ben Stiller and Cameron Diaz, these movies would be nasty, like really cruel, despicable movies. But we're laughing at them and the movie goes in a different direction. This is almost like a romantic comedy. Minus any of the romance and it's almost the other lens of what something like that would be. There's a version of this movie where these two guys try and romance the deaf girl as a joke. Then they start falling for the girl. And then one of them starts having genuine feelings or maybe both of them do. And then it becomes something else. And then there's a message at the end. This kind of has those things, but through a different lens and through a really sinister lens and through something that's really uncomfortable to even be a part of. It's not often I feel uncomfortable watching a movie. And maybe it's because I've been around men like this, not to the extreme that they've done this, but that people talk about locker room talk and, you know, some locker room talk is great, but then there's, there's always this level that certain guys have that's just the worst and this movie absolutely lives in that realm it lives in the realm of <laughs> like bad ambassadors for the worst of mankind it, it's got the absolute well, I don't know if I'd call him a psychopath, but lack of, definitely lacking in vital things in the Aaron Eckhart character. And then they've got the guy who sees himself as a nice guy who is as capable of doing horrible things, but 
views himself as a wounded animal and views himself as the victim and is as nasty even though Aaron Eckert is the ultimate villain of this movie I found the other actor I forget his name Matt something or other I found him really equally if not more despicable in that scene in the car where because she rejected him he's now spilling the beans and he's now saying but I'm not like that I love you and then he gets really aggressive and there's a lot of pent up anger and rage through a victim facade when you're an absolute piece of shit I found that really despicable and it's not often in movies where I can watch normally any type of movie I think you've mentioned this when you're watching movies with your mother before or when I watch it I think maybe if I watched a movie with my mum as well. I remember when I watched The Joker with my mum. <laughs> she she was dividing everything up into good guys and bad guys. And I remember her saying, poor Mr. Joker. Poor Mr. Joker. Isn't that, isn't that Bruce Wayne an awful bollocks? He has all... <laughs> it's, it's divided into like a really strong emotional reaction, which is a great way to view film in one respect and in another respect everything can't be boiled down to good and bad for me it's there's a nature of following these characters that I might necessarily want to hang out with but I'm enjoying aspects of them follow following them around whether that's somebody like Walter White or Tony Soprano you wouldn't want to be around these guys but it's great observing these guys and that's normally the lens I watch anything through, but in this, I found them hard to be around. At, for the most part, and at times. Now, there is certain times where, from an entertainment point of view, for Jesus, this is fucked up. You're kind of enjoying being on the journey for that, but the movie never lets you forget the, the heart of it. And I think that's really important. Not just the heart of it, but the hurt of it as well. And I wonder, and I'm I'm a bit worried, not worried, Jesus Christ, call the village. Someone please think of the children. But I, I just wondered, it's like the Wolf of Wall Street. There was a kind of moral panic with some film critics and some people at the time where you can't show this. You can't show this glorifying kind of thing. You can't. You can't. You can't depict someone like this getting away with these things. You can't depict someone having a good time with this. Was my cat going crazy? If you heard something there, but something like Wolf of Wall Street comes down to okay. If you find that a great life and you find that really fun anything other than an entertainment viewing experience. If you find his lifestyle fun, the movie doesn't need to lecture you on that or not because it's either you do or you don't. And I just worry with this movie. Well, not worry, but almost despair. I can see people laughing at and finding it amusing when he's making fun of the deaf girl or when... Okay, there is one scene where I actually found a little bit amusing... And even then I felt a bit guilty. It's when he's talking about the the deaf girl's sister. And obviously they're both going on dates and they're both exchanging information between the different dates they've had with the deaf girl. And there's a scene where he's saying the sister looks like a, a horse. And then we see the next guy going on a date asking to see a picture of the sister. But we know why he's doing that. I found that a little bit amusing. And I think there'll be people finding... <laughs> I feel like, for me, this was almost like a psychological horror. Maybe something along the lines of a stranger's on a train. Or maybe on the something along the lines of some Hitchcock premise. It's almost... It's almost 
a Hitchcockian premise in a way, in in a much more, one would argue lower stakes, but not really when you're playing with someone's emotions. And I, that's that was my viewing experience. But I'm just wondering, maybe a, a lot of people are watching this are finding this very funny, as well, which. I don't know why that bugs me because everyone's viewing experience is different. And if you have viewed it through that experience, th there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe it's just because I've been around guys who've made jokes like that about people like that, that others have laughed in the room and found it amusing. And maybe I just know that the guys who are s s this movie sending up These jokes are almost written for them, but minus the minus the the ramifications. I don't know. It had a strange effect on me. It's really had a strange effect. Um, yeah, like you said, the visual style, you can tell it's based from a playwright eye. I felt that beforehand, like is it David Mamish or something like that? Um, there is I think there's a movie Coffee and Cigarettes where they have a I had a feel of that the way it's got very limited production and very limited director flourishes. But it has a vibe and a feeling of its own that doesn't make you just think it's on a stage. It's got a few very nice touches like the scene at the end where the nice guy, quote unquote, is shouting at the deaf girl. And then we finally see it from her perspective where she can't hear anything. It just looks like she sees him for who he is at that stage. Minus all the dialogue. It's just an angry man shouting at her, you know. And yeah, I thought the twist was very good as well. The second twist. I did I did catch up on the vibe that Aaron Eckert was quite bitter about the promotion going to his friend. And there was a lot of, a, a little bit of, bitterness under there but he played it so brilliantly that you're not sure in fact Aaron Acker played it brilliantly that at times I'm like does he love her is he starting to fall for her? he's so good he, he pulls the wool over our eyes at times as well and yeah I, I feel like I, I need to check out more by this guy well, I haven't heard anything about I, I thought you came across this movie because when I mentioned company of men, you came across in the company of men. And I say you came across it. I don't even know who this Neil LeFoot is. Is that his name? I don't even know who he is. But I'll be checking out a lot of his movies that you recommend by watching them before me. <laughs> That's how it's going to go, buddy. In advance. And I thought the actress who played the deaf girl as well, I was convinced that she was deaf she did a fantastic job in her mannerisms her movement her eyes even that kind of accent to someone who's got very little hearing has i thought she nailed all that and i feel like the movie sits where her when they revealed their horrible fucking plan to her in the room while she's breaking down i felt like that was a really important scene as well um yeah good stuff good stuff Hey man, yeah, great to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, a lot of the movie sort of coming back to me as you're describing it there. It's been a few days since I've watched it. I forgot some of those nice little details, like um, the, the the very final scene. And yeah, it is it is moments like that that just give it that sort of cinematic flourish, which I suppose, you know, if if he if he is a playwright and I think play director and sort of comes from that world. You'd imagine that if he himself was going to be bringing these stories to the screen, he'd have to have some point of interest. Otherwise, why even bother? Just stick to that other career. Um, so yeah, probably like lots of different little subtle ways that you can present things differently in the in the, the film medium. But um, yeah, just to, to go over the points that you've raised. It is interesting that you you highlight the comparison to a sort of rom-com plot 
almost like screwball comedy, like, you know, what well, she's got to be with him, but then she has to pretend this and they have to pretend they're together. And, you know, these conceits that we're used to seeing and how potentially toxic they could be in reality. Um, the, uh, it's one thing that kind of came to mind, like when you were, you were talking about, um, this being sort of reminiscent of something about Mary or, or Ben Stiller rom-com in general, the movie directly after this one for Nilly Butte, which I've also watched in the last few days, your friends and neighbors stars Ben Stiller and was made more or less at the same time as something about Mary. So it's, it's not just Ben Stiller. It's, it is a very something about Mary looking Ben Stiller. Um, just it, it, the, the movies are incredibly different, but they're, they sort of sit as some sort of weird companion piece to one another. So it's interesting that you kind of highlight that. Yeah. I haven't really thought about it that way. Um, and it's interesting also looking at this film through the lens of comedy. One director that it reminded me a lot of, and this is true of both of the Neil LeBute films I've watched over the last couple of days, is Todd Salons, who made Welcome to the Dollhouse and Happiness and a lot of movies at this same time, late 90s, early 2000s, kind of both had their critical and sort of audience zeitgeist capturing peak around the same time. And they were both making these really acerbic, misanthropic, um, bleak portraits of just a completely fucked world on a sort of human level. Like you could, you watch a film by either of that, either of those directors and you'd come away going, Jesus Christ, it really sucks to be a human and to be around other humans. And Salon's movies are pitch black comedy to the point where like, I find them hilarious, but also incredibly hard to watch at times. But I think a lot of people would watch a film like Happiness and like not even, it wouldn't even occur to them to even think of it as comedy at all. Whereas Neil LeBute's films, these two at least, the ones that are kind of more typically him, because he has also done loads of films as a sort of gun for hire type guy who's like going in and directing other people's scripts and they don't really have anything to do with this sort of focus. But his films that are sort of sourced either directly from his plays or are similar in style to his plays, I would also describe them as black comedies, um, but like when the comedy is operating at the lowest possible wavelength that it's like, it's kind of a weird thing of like, what are you left with if you take out a hundred percent of the jokes from a comedy and it's just sort of like situational absurdity and it still has this kind of energy of comedy of like something, something un unusual is happening and it's like in, in the same way that people will say that action movies like Mission Impossible and stuff are um, are following the language of slapstick comedy to an extent. It's like that set up, that tension, that like build on that and redo that. It, there, there's sometimes comedy kind of almost exists as a framework beyond laughs. And there's just this like uncomfortable, awkward laugh thing, and this tension of a should I laugh, should I laugh kind of thing. It's like it's hard to pin down, but I, but even though I can't quite necessarily justify it, I would still probably describe this movie as a comedy, not not exclusively a comedy, maybe not first and foremost a comedy, but um, it is. Uh, it is very satirical, I suppose. Um, and yeah, it, it, there, like you said, there, there are times where you laugh and it's almost like the movie and Aaron Eckhart or his character rather are like daring you to laugh along with some of the 
horrific shit would be to say and do. And sometimes it's like almost like it's always sunny in Philadelphia where it's just it's so wrong that it's just so perfectly wrong that you gotta laugh and you've almost gotta be charmed by it. Um that's the that's the thing. Like earlier on, when I sent you that earlier voice message, I, I sort of said that you know, you think the film you think that Eckhart is just manipulating the girl like that she's the only sort of prey and then at the end of the movie you find out that there's actually two poems that it's the girl and his co-worker his friend so-called um but upon reflection there's there's really three people that he's toying with and that's the girl his friend and us the audience member yeah it's, it's you could really look at the film through the lens of the is a story of like a devilishly charming guy a complete asshole like absolute piece of shit um who is an expert at hooking and engaging people and enthralling them and controlling their attention and what they see and what they don't see and and sort of getting getting their time and getting their oxygen. Uh, so that's that's interesting if you look at it on that kind of meta level. Uh, you you push back a little on the description of him as a psychopath. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not, when I say psychopath, I'm not talking about someone who's like a sadist, though he clearly is. I'm not talking about someone who's violent or, um, you know, a serial killer or something. I just use the word psychopath purely to describe him as somebody who just like seems to be lacking that kind of conscious like moral consciousness of like um caring about other people's feelings and they they say that you know a, an enormous amount of people are psychopaths and that it's not even a negative trait that for example uh, surgeons should be psychopaths because it's a job that is benefited by not being emotionally invested in what you're doing things like that so uh yeah i'm not i'm not um accusing him of anything more than he <laughs> exhibits in the film i mean that's surely that's enough what we see from him it's probably one of the most probably one of the most evil <laughs> vile characters i mean certainly worse than the villain in any kind of superhero movie or something like that uh and yeah great to see that as well you know it, it is always great i'm thinking of like Vern schillinger in oz played by jk simmons these characters or joe pantiliano's character in in the sopranos you know these characters that come along every now and again and you just like you hate them um this obviously is a, a short movie so you don't have like years of building up hatred towards them it's not quite that king joffrey level engagement but Still, yeah, it's, it's, it's always great to see it so well done. And the make art just absolutely knocks it out of the park with the performance and just delivering all of this dialogue, which is a lot of it is very um, playwrighty, isn't it? It's very um, artificial. And somehow all the actors, but I think Eckhart has the sort of toughest job, somehow they, they manage to sell it. And they manage to make it not feel like you're just listening to the writer. Like often with, let's say, Woody Allen movies, for example, you often feel like you're just listening to the writer. And I, that's true of a lot of um, these kind of either playwrights or just very writery people. Aaron Sorkin, um, Martin McDonough feel that way. David Mamet, to an extent. It's not always a bad thing and you can lean into it. But um, I think this film does a pretty good job of actually selling everything that comes out of everyone's mouth um i like what you said about the the kind of comparison between the two guys and their villainy and how the sort of beta male of the duo is equally vile and maybe even more hateable to an extent he's he, he certainly uh doesn't own it does he he's like he wants to be thought of as the nice guy and he is sort of wandering through life not really contributing anything positive to anyone 
or actually giving a shit about anyone but st- still kind of feeling like he's he's it's just his god-given right to be considered like a decent person whereas Eckhart is just like completely divorced from any uh notion of being like likable or you know or having any kind of like identity as like a, a regular good upstanding member of society he just couldn't care less about that so it's just the, the two-facedness of uh the other character i don't know the name of the actor and i forget the name of the character but he plays it really well and like i said i was a bit disappointed to see that he hasn't had much of a career i mean he's not had no career but certainly hasn't had that Aaron Eckhart thing. I think you see this performance from Aaron Eckhart and you go, okay, there's a lot that we can do with this guy in pretty much any major movie. There's there's room for someone who's able to do this. Whereas the other guy, it's like, you could you could certainly have a bit of a Paul Giamatti thing where you just keep sliding him into small roles here and there. Eventually he gets some big parts, but um, yeah, hasn't really worked out that way. Um... I also agree that it's crucial to this film's success that it does it, it it does due diligence to portraying the victim and the hurts and yeah the 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 story of the girl from her perspective I mean we don't get that many scenes of her we don't get scenes of her on her own for example but we that she's given enough time that you don't feel like the filmmakers or the film is ignorant to the actual real world repercussions and feeling of this and i think that's what prevents this film from being grotesque and i think a lot of people would watch this film and find it too tough or too hard they would find they just can't stand that level of people they hate taking up the majority of the screen time you and i don't really have that block but i think it would be quite sickening for me anyway if we just never got we didn't see her at all pretty much we 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 only saw her like she got like three lines of dialogue and basically just a nothingy part like they give the film is going, look, they're going to do this to this girl. They're going to do this thing. But we're going to show what it feels like for that person. And that, you know, it's not even just like moral responsibility. It's also just good storytelling because it works for the whole thing. And at the end of the day, the whole point of what they're trying to do is to inflict that pain on someone. Um, and I love the... I love the scene when Eckhart tr- like tries for like two seconds to um, <laughs> to pretend that she's got the wrong end of the stick, and then he's like, "Actually, fuck it, like I can't be arsed, like whatever, you, you know, let's just do it." He's so cavalier, he's so casual with everything that he does. Like some secret comes out or something, whatever. He's just basically untouchable because he just doesn't give a shit about anything in this world like the way that he would just like constantly shit talk everyone in his life because it's like if something got back to someone or whatever and they confront he would probably just like frankly speak directly to their face like it's interesting seeing such a like scorched earth person but on a like white collar level it's a fascinating character to, to show um in terms of more neil the butte like i said I've, I've watched this film which is the best that i've seen i've watched your friends and neighbors which i think if you got a lot out of uh, in the company of men which it sounds like you did then that would be the next one to go to definitely um but it obviously won't say which i think is been watching well it's not quite the next um, the, the clarity of or like the precise mission statement that exists in in the company of men that's a once off like i don't think you're going to get that again from him then the next one after in the company of men was nurse bessie which i saw 
you know, 20 years ago, whatever it came out. Um, didn't think it was particularly good. I now learned that he didn't write it. So I'm basically sort of separating his career into like stuff that he wrote and stuff that he just did for other reasons. Um, Harris Betty didn't, didn't like it. Uh, but you know, I was probably too young. I don't think I would have liked in the company of men had I seen it at that age anyway. So it's a bit irrelevant. Um, then there's a couple I haven't seen, and then he brings out the Wicker Man remake, which is a big, high-profile movie starring one of my favorite actors, Nicolas Cage. And, yeah, it, it's become a meme. Obviously, not the bees. Uh, how to get burned. I like it. I think it's a, a fun movie. I think it's got a lot of hilarious stuff in it. And I think it, it, if, if we were to both watch this in the context of is in the company of men a comedy is your friends and neighbors a comedy and then directly go into watching the wicker man i think we have a much more interesting and nuanced conversation than the conversation that has always existed around that film but i also appreciate that it's a remake of a beloved cult movie so it's very hard for a film like that to 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 not get a lot of hate unless it's some sort of masterpiece and then looking at his uh, imdb there's some movies I've heard of, like Lakeview Terrace. I'm not sure if you remember that one where um, Samuel L. Jackson is a cop, but like a bad cop. So it's kind of like, um, what's that movie? Unlawful Entry. It's that, that kind of vibe, um, which seems it seems just like more like a, a trashy thriller, which of course I'm all for and probably will watch that one just because it's intriguing to see someone who makes these kind of movies then go and make just like a complete trashy director video type movie but then uh i don't like to necessarily judge a movie too harshly based on imdb racings because that really is just a reflection of how populous the movie is but his recent output seems to have really not pleased a lot of people now saying that your friends and neighbors already is i think 6.3 on imdb maybe even in the company of men so that you know even at his peak he was um yeah his, his peak, a lot of people i guess hate his movies i can imagine as i'm sure you can a lot of people are gonna watch in the company of men log into letterbox and imdb and just give it the minimum possible rating straight away maybe you only watch half the movie but yeah anyway um but yeah liked it good good flick um and yeah interesting hearing your thoughts on it Anyway, uh, I think that's pretty much everything I got to say about the movie, unless there's anything else that you want to talk about on it. Um, let me know if you're interested in watching Your Friends and Neighbors. Yeah, I, I do have one or two more things to say. Um, not so much about the subjectiveness of comedy, but maybe, I don't know how to put it exactly, but maybe how comedy is used. You mentioned It's Sunny in Philly. That hadn't occurred to me. But there is, there is something to be made for that comparison that they're saying so many outlandish things in this in this movie that you you almost can't believe you've heard it that hadn't occurred to me but for me I looked at it in a kind of different way or a different stance that this didn't really seem over the top to me to hear and again like I said maybe it's because I've heard these things at one stage he makes the joke about a golf ball and a G-spot. And he said, what's the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? You spent 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. And it's like, I'm not sure if that joke is meant to be funny, although I'm sure lots of people will laugh. But what I'm much more interested in talking about, I guess, is what's the intention of 
the director and the writer by using those jokes. And I guess that's where you can distinguish between the comedy of this movie is the intention of that joke to be a joke that makes you laugh or are you meant to I felt like I I didn't find that joke funny nor was it meant to be funny I, I think that was a lot of the jokes in this suggest meant to reinforce how much these people hate women it's kind of like the butt of the joke is that we hate women we find it funny because we hate women and I feel like a lot of the comedy, quote unquote, in this movie is character insights as much as anything. That you, and if there is laughter to be had in a scene like that, it's more that the characters find that joke funny. I found myself laughing a few times that at that. That the characters find this stuff funny, I found funny. You know, it's it's interesting to, to think in what way the comedy has been used in this. Now, there is other times where the comedy is just dead on funny. Now that I'm remembering a, a few things. There's one scene where he, it's very cruel, man, like as well. He finds out the girl is deaf and he finds it so funny. And he's having a conversation with a different co-worker. And they're just treating her like a freak. In their own words even. And he goes into her office. And he shouts really loud at her. Like really aggressively. And that's not funny. But it had me wondering. I was like ain't anybody else going to hear that? He's just shouted. And in the movie. Has another character coming out of her office. Two minutes later. And the look on her face is like, what the fuck was that about? And those moments are very funny in in reminiscent of the TV show The Offices kind of way. But you're right, there, there is a language of cinema, sorry, not a language of cinema, a language of comedy and how this is set up. Like you mentioned the, the argument that a lot of action movies take cues from slapstick. This is a weird comparison, but it's the only thing that springs to mind now. It's like in the movie Fences, where where the movie takes all the traits associated with Denzel Washington, righteous, has all the answers, smooth, demand, and it, it uses the language of what we know about Denzel Washington. <laughs> To make a point that somebody can have these traits and not be those things. And I feel like this movie uses the language of comedy to show that these things aren't funny. Again, I'm not talking about the subjectiveness of if people find it funny. I'm talking about maybe the intention of... Of the, the writer. I feel like. The language of comedy is used. To almost catch you off guard. That you're expecting to laugh. And maybe. You're laughing. Because of the structure. Maybe. And then what they're saying hits you. There's a, there's a lot of interesting dissection. In my opinion of. Of that. That I find fascinating actually and I've lost my train of thought now because my cat started tapping me but yeah I think that's a big part of it and I've never seen that before and with Aaron Ecker, yeah the more I think about it just how good he is in this movie I f- feel he is I don't know if he was... I feel like this is a star-making performance. I don't know how many other movies he had under his belt that was actually good prior to this, but um, looking at the IMDb, there's none that sprung to mind. But he's 
he's just so good in this. And now that I think about it, there has there was a few scenes in this that I enjoyed his how he did his nastiness as well, now that I think about it. It's like that scene in Reservoir Dogs where where Michael Madsen, is it, that's doing the dance and you're enjoying his little dance and you're enjoying the music, you're enjoying his little dance prior to the torture and he's like, bam, cuts the guy's ear off. But you've enjoyed, you've enjoyed it prior and it makes you complicit. And I feel like any time I've enjoyed just in a very technical performance, Aaron Eckert's performance in this, it makes you complicit. Like you mentioned the scene where he's he's trying to cover his tracks when she finds out that it was a big game between them and he switches on the performance and he's like, oh, what you got to understand is, and then he just switches like, you know what, fuck this. And that, for a brief minute, made me, like, not to say made me smile, but I got enjoyment from that scene for a millisecond because he's just so good at switching and just saying, fuck it. You enjoy seeing that on screen. And then, bam, it hits you with the hurt. Bam, it hits you with the the Michael Madsen ear cut off scene and the deaf character is crying her eyes out. And bam, you've enjoyed the second before, but it hits you with the bam. And you're complicit in it then. It's it's brilliant. And even, yeah, I, I do want to see that movie, what was it, Your Neighbour's Friends now with the Ben Stiller thing. And it's interesting as well, again with Hitman, I remember I was watching that with my partner and he's basically lying about his identity and my partner found that, not to say shocking, but she was like, that, that's so wrong, that's so wrong. Whereas my reaction was, well, it's a romantic comedy. You know, they got to, they, you know, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's in the realm of romantic comedy. <laughs> and it, it's like, should I be fine with that? Just for laughs? I don't know. But Eckhart as well, it reminds me of something as well, like Mad Men, where you see this person being so nasty and then they get into the boardroom and it's like, boom. Don Draper's smoothness. Aaron Eckert had a bit of that as well. And you mentioned he doesn't give a fuck about ramifications. That's true. But on the other hand, he's quite manipulative and calculating. There's a whole undercurrent. I don't know if you've caught it, but where he continually messes up his friend's files in order for him to get a demotion. And when his co-workers ask, how is the new boss? He says, yeah, he's a nice guy. So he really plays his hand. And getting to another point that intrigues me, Aaron Eckhart's character says in this both times to his victims, how does it feel? How does it feel? And there's two ways to interpret that. Does Is he a deeply hurt individual that's trying to see Emotions that he can't grapple with because of his super ego expressed on people who he's subjected to such cruel things? Or is he... What's that word? What are those people called that... uh, What are they called? They they study human behavior like anthropological? Is it an, an anthropologist? Is he genuinely lacking that experience? So when he's asking them, how does it feel in terms of their emotion? Is he genuinely curious? How does it feel to have that? Like, both of those theories are interesting and we're exploring. I think it's the former. I think he is hurt at some point and likes seeing that hurt in someone else and because he's inflicted that hurt he feels powerful whereas he felt powerless in the past and I feel like I think that is where the his friend comes from as well they both seem like they've been hurt and lost control so they're trying to 
assert control over their life. However, the fact that Aaron Eckert's character hasn't gone through that, at least in how he says it, and still has his wife at home, adds another layer to that that gets you wondering what what's going on in this character's head. You know? It really leaves you clueless. He really is an enigma and there's there's no definitive unraveling of that. Yeah, and I think the film is all the better for not giving us that explanation or that kind of origin story or backstory. Um, he obviously gives himself that at the beginning of the movie when he talks about how, you know, how he's been treated by women and how the kind of their place within the ecosystem of the business world and their job and the young guys coming up behind them and just kind of like how little satisfaction they're given from the world and how, you know, the, the way that he behaves is, is maybe an, an attempt to regain some power or control, but you know, he's so full of shit as we see, you know, over the course of the film and a lot of what he's describing hasn't actually happened that you can't really just take that on face value and go, well, that is the, that is why he is the way he is. Um, and I think if the film did give us like, I don't know, a scene where he goes to visit his dad and his dad treats him in a particular way and you know, some, something really trite like that, that just tries to put a bow on it, then that would, that would really drop the quality of this film down massively. And it would kind of like tear away the potency of the character. But as you said, they just leave it up to interpretation or they don't even ask you to, to speculate really like, you, you know, you, you're welcome to, but he is who he is. Um, and you know, I'm sure there is an explanation for it. Like if he, if, if you had the opportunity to get to know him and study him and all that, you know, there'd be a combination of just like his inherent psychological factors and then probably various pieces of life experience. But it's much more interesting to just give you him as he is. Um, and yeah, he, he plays it so well. Um, the, what you're saying about the kind of romantic comedy thing, like you're watching Hitman and your girlfriend is talking about the dissection and, and you're going, well, you know, all's fair in romantic comedy kind of thing. That's how I always interpret movies. Like whenever a romantic comedy makes it big or gets really iconic, like Love Actually or something, people start picking apart the ethics of, you know, this person doing this, this person saying this, lying, da 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 and I'm like, this isn't to be taken literally. Like the, the these, we can't hold this up to the scrutiny of real world ethics because it's a fun, bubbly dream world that we're existing within. Um, and and everything is in service of jokes and fun and you know romance and this that and the other. And yes, of course, these scenarios and these people and these decisions would crumble under the microscope of actual real life. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, for me, rom-coms and stuff like that, they're just completely removed. Uh, and of course it is, there is a gradient because you've got like the most heightened rom-coms, then you've got like a mumblecore movie that's, that's still kind of a romantic comedy, but it's also not. Um, so it's not complete binary. Some movies do kind of invite more of that realistic interpretation but this film because obviously it's not a romantic comedy and it's it's taking the scenario it's not it's not that this scenario specifically would be a romantic comedy but if you think about something like 10 things i hate about you or, i mean we could probably list an endless amount of rom-coms that are built around deception all going back to like shakespeare and stuff like that it's you know such a classical uh, plot device and this one, for example, let's say, I mean, it, we could certainly imagine Shakespeare writing a play where two guys decide to sort of play a prank on a girl by like double dating her. And then what would happen is that they would both gradually fall in love with her and then they'd fight for her at the end kind of thing. 
and then maybe she would choose to be with neither of them. In this case, one of them falls in love with her and she falls in love with the other one and it, it doesn't have any kind of like warm, fuzzy ending or or beginning, middle or ending. But still, yeah, watching this without that kind of like, you know, we're not, we're not going to be too harsh on these people because they're not real. This is a romantic comedy. In this one, it's, uh, well, I think the whole point of it is that they're assholes. Like if you watch a romantic comedy and someone does a big grand romantic gesture, and in real life, that would be not okay to do that. Like that would be a dick move. But because it's coded as romantic in the film and it's, you know, you get that's the whole thick sentiment that the film is trying to put across then it works within that film and it, it, it you interpret it as romantic in this film what these guys are doing is sort of laid out more more accurately as what it would be like to do this stuff um and yeah i certainly picked up on like the ongoing sabotage of the main character i do think though like he's of course he's very self-serving and calculating and he's got like a i'm not saying he just doesn't care about anything at all he doesn't have any um goals or he's just like complete chaos i'm not saying that i'm, I'm, I'm saying that he doesn't care about other people and and their suffering and he's also seems to be incredibly fortified as an individual where Let's say he, I can just imagine him if he was pulling one of his schemes to oust someone in a position above him or step over someone for a promotion or get someone fired or something. And then that person found out and confronted him about it. I, I feel like that would, that would be a very easy situation for him to deal with because he's not like, um, unlike the other guy, he's not trying to preserve a good guy image. If he gets found out and exposed as not a good guy. He's just like, yeah, deal with it. It is what it is. Um, whereas the other character, he, it, it's, it, it completely destroys him when what a piece of shit he is, is exposed. And you can just certainly ask the question of like, how bad of a person was he had Aaron Eckhart never come up with this plan? Like at the beginning of the movie, he's completely um, submissive to Eckhart's kind of worldview, his whole screed, his pl obviously his plan that kind of kicks off the movie. But he doesn't really bring anything to the table. Like he doesn't um, initiate anything particularly negative. And we don't know, you know, this film takes place over a few weeks. We don't know what this character may have done in the past but it's an, it's interesting if you kind of look at him as a guy who or not forget guy just as a person it's like that phrase what evil lurks in the hearts of men you know what uh what are we capable of like i i always find it um mind-boggling when people say I'd never do this. I'd never do that. I'd never do that. This guy did that. I'd never do that. It's like, no, it's not that you'd never do that. It's that you have never done that. You don't know what you would do. You can, you can certainly um, say that particular pieces of behavior are completely repugnant to you and you really disrespect it and you're incredibly morally opposed to it. And therefore, you feel that it would be incredibly unlikely that you would do it. But because you haven't existed in every possible scenario, you know, the infinite monkeys on the typewriters type thing, you haven't, your your life is yet to play out. You don't know what twists and turns it's going to take. You don't know what, how your personality is going to evolve. You don't know how your circumstances is going to involve. So it just seems like arrogant and naive to say, well, I know I would never do this. Other people do that. That's bad behavior. That's like, I don't like that, you know, they can do it, fair enough, but me, I wouldn't, I'm not that guy. Um, yeah, I find that really hard to connect with. And like, there's obviously plenty of things that I hope I never do. And I, I 
feel I'll never do because of my opposition to, to doing those things. But I'm not going to sit here and go, I know the limits of everything I'll ever do kind of thing. Um, because I just don't know what kind of person I'm going to be and where, you know, what my circumstances are going to be and all that kind of stuff. So I find that subject matter quite interesting. And the the non Aaron Eckhart character, who I should probably learn the name of the actor, but he he is a bit of a study in that because he's someone who, had he not had the devil sat on his shoulder coming up with this plan, egging him on, trying to make it seem fun and lighthearted. Well, he probably wouldn't have done this thing. I mean, he certainly wouldn't have come up with this idea. And, and you know, frankly, he just wouldn't have done this thing. And, but he would still be the same person. So it's like, he wouldn't even know that he is the guy in this movie, potentially, or it certainly wouldn't have been laid bare for all to see. And, and a film that kind of tackles that that goes look we are we are our behavior you you know you put your money where your mouth is kind of thing but we might do some pretty shitty stuff if uh if things were you know set up in a particular way and i'm not saying like we you know we're capable of doing anything like you know just the right person gets in your ear and suddenly you're like killing people so i don't mean that but I do think that every day we wake up and we have the opportunity to be like a better or worse version of ourselves. Could literally be, you're looking back in the day, you're like, you know, I could have held the door open for that old lady, but I figured she was walking too slow and I just wanted to get on about my business. So I, she was too far away and I was like, you know what, I won't do it. But I could have done it and it wouldn't have made it, you know, my day would have been perfectly fine. Or, you know, I got up to the till and there was that person and I could have let them pay or I did let them, I did let them go in front of me because they didn't have much stuff but maybe I could have not done that and it's like we are on a very tiny level we have all these like constant opportunities to be better or worse versions of ourselves and then sometimes we have dramatic um opportunities but even all the little ones they're they're kind of they build us out as in as a different person and so we're we're constantly malleable um and then it's like, well, if you did all of the bad choices, are you still that good person? You know, it's 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 a it's complicated stuff, but it's it's very interesting, and it's, it's interesting to see a movie about it. There's a there's a great movie. I won't say the name of the movie because it's kind of a spoiler about the movie, but there's a character in it who people say of him that he's a really good person, like a really nice lovely brilliant upstanding person and that he'd never do anything bad kind of thing and that actually ends up kind of becoming a point of mental anguish to him because he's like how can how can anyone know that of someone how can i know that of me i don't know i might be capable of murder and then he does commit murder um because he wants to see if he can like he 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 can't he can't bear not knowing how shitty of a person he could be um which I'll, i guess i'll just recommend that movie to you randomly in like a year's time or something <laughs> so that it's not tied to that uh to what i've just said but yeah anyway interesting subject matter in very interesting characterization of the two leads in the movie i believe it was eckhard's uh, first movie or breakthrough movie I think he paired up with Le Butte and made plays with him and that's how he got this job and then yeah I think if you watch your friends and neighbours you'll be seeing him again shortly uh, so yeah good play glad we got to discuss it um, it's just a morning here a bit of a bleak grey British summer morning so just have my morning cup of tea. I'm gonna head out and do a bit of grocery shopping. So the actor's name who plays the opposite Aaron Eckhart is Matt Malloy. And the actress who plays the deaf woman is Stacey Edwards. 
and do with that what you will with your memory. Jesus. Cat just woke up giving me a fucking bollocking. Um, yeah, what you say about the Matt Malloy character at the beginning of the film being, we'll say, quite submissive, if that's the word you used, or quite idealist. Not an I not an idealist, but without idea. <laughs> um I feel and again, we don't know the Eckhart character's true motivations and nor can we unravel them, but I feel it's presented to us in the beginning of the film that the Matt Malloy character is equally angry, equally wounded, and equally venomous as the Eckhart's character. I feel like they're presented in very much the same place, except Would you let me send a voicemail? Voicemail. Jesus Christ, she's getting involved. Um, but the Matt Malloy character's hate is much more internalized, but you can see it's there. Whereas the Aaron Eckhart's character is much more externalized. And I feel like the movie has a lot to say about where hate, where damage, where bitterness goes when it's channeled through the wrong avenues. And, and obviously the Eckhart character is very much a wrong avenue. And it's almost like, you know, those Magto people, if that's what they're called, where, or even the opposite end of that, extreme feminists, where a lot of their beliefs are tied up in hate and bitterness and like, fuck all women and fuck all men. And it's coming from a place of being wounded by the opposite sex. I feel like Matt Malloy. His character is is an example of that. How something like hurt and sorrowful emotions can change you into a real menace and a real horrible person. And it will kind of explain why he still sees himself as the victim. Because maybe in the beginning he is the victim. But how that manifests does not make you the victim. And I, f I feel like that's what is so well written about that character. Regarding your much broader philosophical questions that this movie brought up, that I absolutely love talking about as well, I always feel <laughs> like if you're the type that thinks you won't do something or aren't, not won't do something but aren't capable of doing something you're very much the type of person that would be capable of doing that in the sense that self-awareness that you need to constantly be a better version of yourself to stop doing things and to just be constantly holding yourself accountable for your actions and knowing that if you let your slip, you, yourself slip, you are capable of doing things, whether minor or major, it depends. And I guess you don't get to decide if something's major, if it has a major effect on people. That's what I kind of believe. And you were mentioning the doors opening and things like that for the old lady <laughs> and whatnot. True story, I I killed a fly the other day. 
and I started feeling really fucking bad about it because again this is when I had my toothache normally I try and usher them out the windows spiders and flies and all that if I can but this time the fly was in the way of my screen it was really hard already to do my work and I just went smack splash the fucking fly up against the window and then I started thinking why did I do that I didn't need to do that I didn't need to fucking callously just smash up something because it was inconvenient to me and I wasn't taking the ramifications of an action to end the fucking life of a creature or whatever I was just thinking in that moment about my fucking tooth about just what would be convenient for me about me 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 and yeah but that might that might seem laughable in some ways but it is an example where you do something that you really don't need to do because you feel in a certain way at a space level and even towards the more broader questions that you mentioned in terms of oh could you be potentially a bad person could you potentially be a good person in in certain circumstances absolutely and I even feel like it's very complicated, man, but it's so interesting, like you said. Um, I had this conversation recently. Is it how you see yourself inside and the actions you want to take that makes you a good person, potentially, or is it your actions? I fully feel it doesn't matter what you think inside. It's your actions and how you influence the world negatively or badly or negatively or positively that will decide if you're a good person because it doesn't really matter what's going on in your head it's what you do that defines you however once you've done that I don't think that act or acts would define you necessarily either because you can be for instance I knew a guy and he went to prison, he had a hard childhood and he used to beat up people for drug money. And those actions are terrible. Those actions he never can get back. He can never take back. And for the people he beat up for drug money, he is objectively a monster because that's their experience. But then he went to Vietnam, started teaching kids, became a very productive member of society, changed completely. And his actions for this group were absolutely fantastic. And his previous actions for the people that he put in hospital were terrible. Both are true. (laughs) But what can you do once you've done something, you know? What can you you just fucking done? So it's true that, you know, I think you have to distance yourself from an environment and distance yourself from... from things that have previously defined you but you can go somewhere else and you can make a difference in a positive way action wise somewhere else so what does define a person and it depends who you're talking to about that person very fascinating stuff but yeah I, I love films like this that are very entertaining are very well written and have questions that you can apply to life and you can use the film to talk through those aspects of life I fucking love that stuff and the such a a rare gem of a movie I hadn't even heard of this so a nice snowball of me company of men coming across my desk and we ending up with (laughs) in the company of men yeah it's a really um strange happenstance that watching the company men or whatever that movie was called which in itself was incredibly unlikely that we would have ended up watching it some unremarkable 2010 movie that i've never heard of uh but yeah that that then led us to watch in the company of men which now seems to be leading us to your friends and neighbors yeah but um 
very provocative movie in the company of men. As you said, it's great when you see a movie that kind of brings you to consider your own ethics and philosophy. And I think um, Lars von Trier movies will often do that for me. So it's it's good that you've also watched it so I can actually have a conversation about it because as as enjoyable as watching the movie was, I think it really benefits from chewing it over with someone. Uh, but yeah, anyway, um, good flick. We've kind of talked about it as much as we can. So on to the next one. Your mailbox is full. Please delete new or stored messages which you no longer need so that new messages may be received.